welcome. This is Seriously Speaking. These remain interesting times, but I'm going to go back a little bit in history to remind you of some of the good old glory days on Seriously Speaking today. Now, between 1960 and 1975, agriculture contributed over 65% of Nigeria's gross domestic product consistently for a period of about 10 to 15 years. Back then, Nigeria used to be the leading exporter of cocoa, cutting, and rubber. But today, this is no longer the case. You only read about that in the history books. Now, the likes of Ivory Coast and Ghana have dominated us in the exportation of these same products. Some say that the discovery of oil and its subsequent exploration from the late 1970s has been largely responsible for the decline of the agricultural sector in Nigeria. Today, approximately 70% of the Nigerian population engages in farming. However, majority of these 70% only produce enough just to feed their immediate families. Many farmers do not have enough land, while some cannot afford mechanized equipment to venture into large-scale agricultural production. But in recent times, with the strides made in agriculture by the current government, people are beginning to talk more about agriculture. And there's some progress. How much of that progress do you think you can be a part of? On this show today, I have four experts, some who are actually practicing it, some who are researching it, to help us look at this sector, which should be the biggest, considering the fact that so many people are farming. Are they farming right, or are the wrong people going into farming? We'll be discussing that today, especially because oil is no longer the king of the road. It can't be, not with what's happening in recent times. So we'll take a break, and then we'll return to meet my guests on Seriously Speaking today. And my name remains Adesuwa Unyenukwe. Yes, welcome back. I'm going to start at some place everybody likes, chicken. People like chicken on the tables, people like to eat, but you know that chicken also has to get farmed. When you talk about farmers, you don't think about, you know, things like chicken, you think about seeds and water and soil. Now, my guest is the president of the National Association of Poultry Farmers. He's a doctor, but not an ordinary doctor, he's a veterinary doctor. It's my pleasure to introduce the first guest on this show, Dr. Ayola Odunton, and I'm going to welcome you by walking up to meet you right here. Dr. Odunton, come up and join me in the studio. It's nice to have you here. Nice to have you. No, come this way. Yes. Welcome to one, to seriously speaking. Thank you very much. Please have your seats. Okay. What's happening with avian flu, Dr. Odunton? <laughs> um, avian flu has come. It's a poultry disease that has public health significance. We as farmers are used to poultry diseases. We see them all the time. So it's not news to you? It's not so much news to us. Um, a lot of work has gone on to do a much better job than we did in 20, 2006 when it happened the first, the first time. Mm -hmm. um, fewer cases, fewer states, quicker interventions. So avian flu has come and it's on its way out. I mm -hmm. think it's um, on decline now. Did you choose to study veterinary medicine? Yes, I did. Did you ever think about maybe, you know, how did you plan to practice it? We think about the vet as those who take care of dogs or horses. True, true. <laughs> but I used to go to the market with my mother and um, seeing the number of people buying food struck something in me that there is an opportunity to make a lot of money. So I went into veterinary medicine to make money. Mm -hmm. Um, I love dogs, I've always had dogs, mm -hmm. you know, but for me it was about producing food to make money. Okay, now we work, you work with Sanders for a bit. Yes. And you eventually, you know, your firm... Well, tell us about, the, you know, the transition from Sanders to AY, your firm. To my company. Mm -hmm. um, upon graduation, I did my youth service with Pfizer's Livestock Feeds in Kaduna, and that exposed me to the... Um, large animal industry that is cattle, sheep, goats, poultry. And then after that, I um, started to work with Sanders Feeds, which was a French company doing good business, producing animal feeds in Nigeria. And they were selling the old chicks as well. So um, I worked with them for 13 or so odd years. And um, they decided to leave Nigeria because the circumstances around the country were very poor. They sold two of their small companies, and I was fortunate to buy those two companies. 
And that's that was how foresight. I started. What do you think? I mean, there's a lot of talk about agriculture, farming, and things like that. Now, when you hear that, it's mm. like, is Niger do you think like Nigeria is beginning to wake up now, after all these years? Um, Nigeria talks a lot of talk, but they don't walk that talk. Um, the Honorable Minister of Agriculture, to whom I must doff my hat, has done so much to bring agriculture to the forefront. I probably would not be sitting here if somebody like that did not make agriculture an issue. I've been doing agriculture for 24 years now. And um, the reaction I used to get five, 10 years ago from bankers, from other, is totally different now. You know, and I think that has a lot to do with bringing agriculture to the fore. But it's still not um, where it should be, because less than 2% of our budget is devoted to agriculture. Even up until now, that Even it seems up like we're until doing so now, much. When it should be about 10 according to Maputo Declaration of 2003. So we still need to do so much, you know, to um, make agriculture what it is. Now tell me, has, with this change in perception, has it improved anything at all? I mean, I'm sure that 24, 25 years ago when you started this, could you, you know, would you say there's a difference between the benefits when it comes to the money that you make simply because people have a better awareness of the value that the farmer brings to the table? Yes, there is. Or well, they don't even see you as a farmer still, do they? <laughs> I am a farmer, mm -hmm. proudly so. And uh, Nigeria is such a fantastic country. There is immense opportunity here. And things are growing, regardless of what anybody says. This country is moving forward. So um, things have improved. Margins have declined. I was going to say that. Margins have declined. Um, volumes have increased. So um, it's going the way other industries have gone. There's more specialization. We know how to farm now much better. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody has an aunt that used to have chicken and all of them died. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. that doesn't happen anymore because our medicine is better, our management is better, husbandry is better, and you know, the better drugs, better vaccines. So definitely things have moved forward. Uh, smaller margins, wider volumes, you know, yes. bigger volumes, and that's what's yes. most critical. But then I think these things happen, I wonder if financing is any better. But I, I would like to in, uh, invite the, the, uh, somebody who, well, who's also a young un, unnatural farmer or unusual farmer mm. to join me and let's discuss how she ended up becoming a farmer too, like mm. you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Odonton. Thank you very much. I appreciate much. your being here with us. My pleasure. Don't go away. We'll be back. Yes, welcome back. My next guest also produces protein because she's done fish, she's done chicken, she's done snails, which I love very much, by the way. And I remember meeting her at one conference, one of the Wimby's conferences, and she was peddling packages, packages of dried and smoked fish. So a young lady walking around, I'm like, what's this? Well, I'm a farmer. I'm like, what? This young lady a farmer? You know, even I, my perception of farmer is that, um, like the Yoruba song that says, Ishe agbe, Ishe ilewa. You've got to till the soil to be a farmer. But it's my pleasure to introduce some beautiful young farmer, uh, Musumola Cynthia Umuru. It's nice to see you, Musumola Umuru. That combination is something else. I'm a full Nigerian. <laughs> <laughs> so you have gone all over the place. You remember the first time I met you? You yes, were selling that fish. I yes. made me buy it by all means, and it was delicious, by the way. Thank you, Auntie. But that wasn't when you started farming, was it? No. Because it was about two years ago. Yes. Mm -hmm. I started farming 10 years ago. 10 years ago? Yes. Wow, you were still in your 20s. Straight out of college. Mm -hmm. <laughs> A mm -hmm. greenhorn. Very really young. Trying to find myself, mm -hmm. and I found my niche in agriculture. How does a 21, 22-year-old girl think become an, a farmer, I think, is farming that you want to do? I wanted to do something different. Um, at the time I was graduating from college, everyone wanted to work in the oil industry. But well, you even had a short stint there. I had there. a stint you were working there. with Exxon I, 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 got, I worked with Exxon. I mean, I did my internship with Exxon for about six months, and it suddenly hit me. This is not what I want to do for the rest of my life. It's going to be pretty boring just doing routine. There was no adventure. There was nothing to look forward to. I had too much energy to be contained in that space. Um, but agriculture gave me expression. Um, my ability to go wake up in the morning, look at my dill chicks, and then raise them from that tiny little creature to 
a huge table sized bird that I can market just fills my life. It gives me fulfillment. And um, I won't trade that for anything else. But I wonder why you find something that is, it's not that easy, isn't it? I mean, no, for, for a female, you want things that are easier, that your nails are still looking, um, you know what I mean? The truth is, a lot of girls want that. I'm not cut out for that. Mm -hmm. And then you could buy those things, you know. Um, when I'm done doing the dirty work and you I come into the, the city, I buy the nails, buy the hair if I have to. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll be glam all the same. I, I go to the farm looking glam, but when it's time to get hands on, I get dirty. Um, it's, it's, it's just a big twist that I enjoy. It's different. And um, leaving my mark in the sector, Above all, trying to even work with young people to get them to see that beyond farming, farming can be glamorous, farming can be cool. Lucrative. Farming is cool, actually. Um, one of the young ladies we worked with recently said, farming isn't just cool, sis. Farming is the coolest. Mm -hmm. And it's the new cool. It's the, it's, it's the coolest because I say to people that as long as man is alive, there's only one thing he can do without. After breathing air, uh, I can choose not to wear new clothes. I can choose not to buy a new car, but I can't decide to go on a hunger strike, hunger strike indefinitely. Mm -hmm. So everyone has to eat. The question I then pose to people is, if we all desire food and we all require food, what are we doing about producing the food that we eat? What are we doing about the quality of the food that we consume? And that for me just created a niche and a huge opportunity that I've embarked on 10 years and I have no regrets About at it. all. No, well, Honeysuckle no. is a result of that, but you actually went to school, went to Zaria to try and get a, <laughs> a, a degree or Kano. Kano, bio-university Kano. To get a degree in medicine. Yes, That medicine. in the 90s, wanted yes, to go I to did. school. And then you said that opened your eyes to the dynamics of food. Absolutely, absolutely. But you didn't do medicine again though. I didn't, I quit medicine and came back to Lagos and told my father that, you know, Meeting was for me to help people, but I can't help people if I'm not wealthy. And I believe that the only place I can find wealthy. the kind of money I want is in agriculture. And he was disappointed, he was upset at the point, but today my father is my biggest fan. You know, he's seen how far farming has taken me to serve at the AU as a youth consultant when they needed someone for agriculture. All of those exposure, has come as a result of staying within the agricultural space. So why did you choose that space? You were talking about the experience in Kano. When I got to Kano, I saw huge, I, I tasted Fura de Nunu for the first time. I tasted Zobo drink for the first time. And then I asked myself, Nigeria has been, is blessed with a lot of um, products and food items that we're not even celebrating. We all go abroad and buy cranberry juice. We all buy um, grape juice. We all like those exotic fruits. But we have our own natural food products that we're not even, that are rich in nutrients, flavonoids, carotene. And for me, I just thought, hey, start bottling Zobo. So I came back home with these dry leaves and my father fought me heavily that I brought dirt into the house. That's what he saw, dried leaves, dirt. All I saw was money, wealth, out of those dried leaves. So I can authoritatively say, I was the first person to bottle Zobo in sealed and containers. And I was young at the time. And that evolved, that business has evolved from bottling Zobo, baking cakes, making bread, to farming chickens, farming snails. And today, one of the re re um, recent um, engagements we've had is setting up the farm shop where busy executives, busy wives, young Nigerians can actually walk into, order their own fresh food produce, fresh chicken, fresh vegetables, and you can order online, you can call in. You know, all of that activity is bringing the business twist into an agricultural space that looks either too unglamorous, unpopular, is uncelebrated, and making it look fab enough for young people to want to engage. Well, more, more interestingly though, in the past couple of years, you've been working very closely with the Minister of Agriculture. Oh yes, we young have. Of young, uh, yes, young we farmers. have, um, because we have a dynamic minister right now who, who believes that he needs to synergize, collaborate with practitioners to actually bring up um, the, the robust agricultural sector we want to have in Nigeria. So one of the things that has come out of those engagements and meetings is a, a program 
called the Youth Enterprise in Agricultural Program. Youth Employment in Agricultural Program, TAD YIP. Now, what YIP seeks to do is identify young people between the ages 18 and 35 who want to be in agriculture or who are already practicing in agriculture and support them to take their businesses and their enterprises to the very next level. So on the 16th of December 2014, there was a presidential launch around that program after two years of drafting and designing mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. program. And in January this year, a grant of about 122 million was disbursed to a number of young people. Do you, did you have people struggling to be part of this? Is um, agriculture, you it, know? Yes, now we now have people clamoring to want to be a part of the program because they see that it's real. Mm -hmm. um, initially, some people thought it was a hoax, it was another scheme of the federal government. Mm -hmm. So this is like a Ewing type agricultural program okay. where young people can come in. So these first beneficiaries are actually practitioners who are on the field already. So grants from about a million to five million was made in different tranches to different to young people. people. So at the end of the day, finance is being made available yes, to them Yes, because, now. I mean, um, interestingly, at the, at the disbursement of the, the ceremony, there's a particular young lady who I remember very well who is making, I mean, the coolest and the finest leather bags I have seen in a long time. What's that going to do with agriculture? Because you get hide from hide and skin from cows and from goats. So she uses goat skin and cow hide to make her bags. She has a goat farm. It's, it's, it's very interesting that she's setting up her own tannery where she would start um, tanning the leather herself, treating them, because now someone else treats her leather for her. And um, it might interest you to know that she's a fashion week as we speak. Um, she's exhibiting her product. So those are the kind of people we want to showcase going forward okay, because so our culture is beyond chicken, tilling the soil. There's a value addition to, to our culture. Absolutely, I agree. Yes. And finance is a key factor. That's why I want somebody from Sahel Group to join me. And let's talk about this issue of financing and how it has also... That will be helped. very engaging. Yes. So uh, I thank you, Musun. Uh, let's you go for now, just for a few minutes before we're going to engage thank on the panel. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you for you having much. me. And thank you for staying there. Remain there as we continue on Seriously Speaking today. We're speaking agriculture. Yes, I am in the studio this time with Ulumide Lawsing. I had to look here to be sure that I have all the all the de descriptions right. But I know his background was in finance and he's right now a director with Sahel Capital, a private equity and advisory firm focused primarily in agribusiness in Nigeria. Prior to his current, current role, he had spent 15 years with a career in finance. What I, what I find interesting about this company that he represents as this young man is because through them, there's another company that is called Ace Foods that manufactures um, condiments. And the first time I met them, let me introduce Olumide first. Olumide, thank you for joining thank us. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate that you made that such a short notice. Thank you. But I know that for your company, when it comes to agriculture, they are always excited to talk about it, yes. you know, animated and all of that. And so tell me about, I don't know where to go there, in the area of Ace Foods, for first of all, you know, what's the relationship between Sahel and Ace Foods? Okay. And what is Ace Foods, by the way? <laughs> okay, Ace Foods is, is, is a spice making company. Uh -huh. It's actually one of the first investments that um, Sahel made. Okay. You know, I think how we saw it was that uh, we have always been preaching agriculture and it was time for us to put our money where our mouth Oh. is mm -hmm. um, Sahel started about five years ago, you know, and what we've done over the last five years, we actually focused on agriculture. Maybe, maybe Collecting should... money from people to give to people in agriculture? Um, well, no. We started about five years ago as actually business consultants. So oh. over that period, we actually, almost we do, what we we were mostly business consulting, crop, crop value chain analysis, mm -hmm. um, market survey and stuff like that, you know, and um, we, we continued over time doing that. In 2010, we actually, was where we started Ace Foods, you know, where we saw the need for spices in Nigeria. So it's not like that was your intention? No, not at all. It just happened, you saw this vacuum? Yes, and the vacuum we saw actually much more than just spices. I think um, in Nigeria, about 73% of the food, um, cost of um, what Nigerians spend is actually on food, which is, for most of the other countries, about 15% or 16%. Wow. You know, which Not shows on that, telephones. Yeah. <laughs> I thought telephones are taking no, over. No, it's still food, you know, which, which shows that um, food is actually expensive in Nigeria. Oh, yeah. And as, the way we saw it was that it's going to get worse because a study shows that um, the population of Nigeria is actually growing. Mm -hmm. And the question is, if, if it continues to grow, how are we going to feed ourselves, you Probably know. Probably eating each other. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so we, um, I think Sahel actually saw the opportunity in agriculture even before it became 
so well known. But is it a know? good area to invest money in? And the circumstances, are the circumstances right? Has it proven right for you guys? Well, I would say definitely yes. You know, we had mentioned the first, which was Ace Foods, which has actually been a very good investment. I think this time around, the government has actually shown a lot of political will to actually let that area mm -hmm. actually grow. Mm -hmm. And with the um, agric agricultural transformation agenda of 2011, I think the government actually put a, a good step forward, you know, to actually develop agriculture in Nigeria. There's been several policies put in place to actually handle all the pain points in agriculture. So I think it's actually a very good place to invest. And maybe later I'll talk about some a fund that we manage. And then mm -hmm. what we've seen is that agriculture is not only um, showing a lot of, there's a lot of impact that's showing in agriculture, but there's actually a lot of money to be made as well. You know, and we have, we have a it, fund okay. on, on the that line. Money? <laughs> is that where the problem is? Well, we see that it's actually as good, the money can be as good as the oil business, which is why we agree with you that agriculture is really the new oil. Uh -huh, you know, uh -huh. there, there were, in the past, Nigeria has actually made a lot of money in this area. Mm -hmm. I think that was in the 60s, as you mentioned, yeah. um, we, about 80% of our foreign revenue is actually coming from oil. Now it's just it's coming from agriculture, but now it's less than 2%. You know, I know Nigeria can actually get to that point. You know, now we import so much, but most of what the things that we actually import, we can actually make in this country. Hmm. Could it also be a function of um, anything that is made out of Nigeria is better than Nigeria? That mentality. Well, um, I think in the agricultural sector, that's a little bit different because um, I think gradually people are beginning to realize that they want to have their food fresh. I mean, you, you, you remember, know? when we imported chicken was everywhere. Yes. It still is everywhere. Yes. Imported juices, imported everything mm. that we consume. Well, well, I think um, the lifestyle is changing. You know, if you talk to the average Nigerian, rather than eat imported chicken, they would rather eat freshly made chicken. I would prefer to eat chicken that I knew that was just cooked, that was just slaughtered one hour ago than the one that has been on the high seas for the, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think, of course, many times the cost of production in Nigeria is actually a bit higher, so which makes the imported product a bit um, cheaper. cheaper than the ones in Nigeria. But things are changing. I think as more people are coming to realize the opportunities in agriculture, more production is increasing, the costs are actually improving as well, mm -hmm. you know. So, I mean, you made a very valid point that it's political will. It means that if any organization or anybody, any leadership realizes the value of agriculture, they will put money in it and then, do you think enough money is going in there yet? Well, um, Because you are in the private sector. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say not yet. You know, even um, right now, the, some studies show that um, the demand for agricultural finance is actually about $5.5 billion. You know, but what is actually annually? Yes, annually, mm -hmm. and the supply right now is just about one. I think about five percent of that. Wow! You know, it's even worse because for most um, for most of the banks, I think of the, of the entire bank portfolio, about just about five percent, it goes into agricultural financing, mm -hmm. and of this five percent, eighty-five percent goes to finance the big the agricultural big. companies. Uh -huh. You know, the industries. You know, which leaves about fifteen percent for the SMEs, the, the SMEs, and then the microfinance, I'm sorry, the smallholder mm -hmm. finance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. so what we, what um, Fafin does, a fund that we manage, is actually to focus on that area. So definitely there is actually a lot of financing required in that gap. area. There's a but, gap. Yeah, okay. but I think we're getting there. And people are realizing that there's actually money to be made, which is making people actually invest more in um, but agriculture. I, I wonder, though, if people are investing in, um, in research. That's why I'm going to invite my next guest, okay. who's from IITA. Because no matter what it is, if you put money in agriculture and we're not finding better ways to bring our produce, yes. I mean, I guess it will just be Definitely. a no-brainer, right? Definitely. Or a no-winner. Yes. So thank you, Limide, for thank sharing you this much. few insights and with thanks us. Thanks for having me. I will take a break and I'll return after that break with um, the uh, representative, Dr. Richardson, from uh, IITA. Don't go away. Yes, I'm in the studios with somebody who I would describe as a king of Gary because he's on the transformation project with the Institute of International Institute of Trans uh, Tropical Agriculture, IITA. Dr. Um, Richard Okechuku is the project coordinator for the Cassava Transformation Project. It, I'm very pleased to have you here. Thank you very you much. Know. I say you are, you are the king of cassava. I mean, well, how exciting was it working on cassava, a product that all of us love? Because that's where we get Gary from. Yes. You get much more than uh, Gary from cassava. And sadly yeah. so. That's causing us problem <laughs> now, isn't it? Well, it's not a commercial crop. 
So every user of the route has to pay a good price to get it from the farmers. So mm -hmm. it's becoming more and more competitive to access. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the traditional uh, users of the route, which are the garlic processors, mm -hmm. now have a challenge to in accessing the route as well, and then to keeping up the, the, the price to, mm -hmm. for the consumers that buy the garlic from them. So it's not that Gary is um, is been at price. You've been enjoying it for a long time, very cheap. But mm -hmm. um, it is a good thing for the farmers. It's a good thing because for many years the cassava production uh, in Nigeria is wasted. It's not uh, utilized. What do you use it for? One thing. Mainly for Gary, but in some other parts of Nigeria, you find that they consume the starch in Delta State. Mm -hmm. If you go to uh, Benue, Nasarawa, they produce cassava chips. Most of those cassava chips are exported informally to Niger, Mali, Chad, mm -hmm. and they buy it to reconstitute it into their own food. Uh, so, but recently now we now have a lot of cassava based industries. We have the ones that turn it into starch. We have the ones that turn it into high quality cassava flour. This is the one you can blend with wheat to make bread. Okay, that's the popular cassava bread that we hear. Yes, but apparently yeah. we still don't have enough production of that. Tell me how the transformation product, project has opened our eyes to cassava and is that making it difficult for ordinary gari eaters like us not to find it as easily? <laughs> Well, uh, one good thing it has done, it has brought people to notice the crop and to start thinking of market. Before you grow mm -hmm. cassava, you have to think of market. Okay, you have to know who you are producing for. Are you producing the root to sell the fresh root? Are you going to produce the root and probably turn it into a more durable product, maybe chips or gari or so on? So people now look towards the market. Now, the transformation agenda has um, uh, brought it such that it's not easy that any farmer who is participating in growing the crop has this opportunity mm -hmm. to not just to produce for food, but also to increase his income. Okay. What they are doing mostly now is to see how you can decentralize the processing factories in different parts of Nigeria so that these factories are closer to the points of production. Okay. Uh, before, uh, some few years ago, most of the factories are in the southwest here. There's only one in Anambra state. Factories that do what? That, that's... that process and uh, I use cassava for making products like starch. Starch is very popular. Not high quality industrial cassava, starch. Industrial starch, mm -hmm. high quality cassava flour, sweeteners, glucose syrup. You use it in sweetening your drinks, your drugs, uh, alcohol. Uh, like uh, the, the, the beer industry. they make it the beer industry as well. They are also there. The flour industry I also mentioned. Uh, they also make use of it. These are all available. And then the gari also has become a big business. There are people who are producing high quality cassava gari uh, uh, in large volumes. Then we still uh, don't forget that there are people that eat other foods like lafu. Mm -hmm. Also from cassava. Also too. from cassava. Mm -hmm. They also eat those, those kind of food. So um, the transformation agenda is, is doing something. Transformation such project or transformation agenda? What is it? Transformation agenda project. Okay, that's yeah. what it's called. I thought yes, it was okay. Yes. Well, uh, it's doing, uh, playing a, a, a great role of connecting all the key players. In is this it about sectors. researching to find better yields from cassava, or what is that part of the pro project? It's, it's a part of it. Everything starts from research. The varieties of the cassava, the one that will give you more gary, the one that will give you more starch. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of research. It takes 13 years to develop a variety of cassava. Wow. You have to now multiply these sticks and to provide it to the farmers to use. Mm -hmm. Then there is agronomy surrounding that. You have to also look at the soil fertility of growing the crop. You have to look at the inputs that are required. Managing weeds in the farm is a challenge. The labor is a challenge. Mechanization is very important, and of course, labor. So now all of this information is domiciled at IIT. People can get information, have access to learn if cassava happens to be the direction they want to go. It's domiciled in IIT and it's also domiciled with our partners like the National Root Crop Research Institute, Mudike, and mm -hmm. so many other 
players that are on board in Nigeria working on cassava. Mm -hmm. Yes. So do you think, because, I mean, today, cassava, is cassava originally from, I hear that it's not from Nigeria originally, tapioca is from somewhere, from Brazil or somewhere. Yeah, cassava, is it true? cassava came into Africa from Southern Africa, Southern America. Mm -hmm. Yes, and we gave them the, the cowpea. The beans. Oh, okay. <laughs> so when the Portuguese we are doing their trade, they mm -hmm. brought they mm -hmm. brought the crop mm -hmm. here. But it has so adapted to Africa that we even get much higher yields than they are getting. I hear we are the biggest exporters of the cassava starch. Is that true? Uh, no, we are the biggest producer of mm -hmm. the crop. We are increasing in our ex production of starch and, and export is coming up, but not the biggest. The biggest uh, yes. at the main time is Thailand. Okay. Thailand is a key uh, producer. They don't eat cassava. All their cassava is dedicated to just processing. So is it bad that we're eating the cassava or what? No, <laughs> we have to eat food. Okay, so, we're, so we're we can say we should pro produce more. Food security, yes. You mm -hmm. have to balance it. The food security must be well taken care of. Mm -hmm. And then we have to turn it to a money-making venture. All the excesses need to go into some form of income generation for the producers okay. and everybody in the sector. Okay, I thank you for opening my eyes to what cassava really means. When they say cassava is king, it's important. Yes. But also, I want to look at it as an opportunity for people to see that this is one area I can go into. Mm -hmm. And then when we return on the panel, I will invite my other guests to sit down and look at other ways in which agriculture can benefit not only you know, people who are already there, but sure. people who might be interested in going into it. Thank so you. we'll take a short break so that we can go back and engage on this particular issue, agriculture, on the panel, on Seriously Speaking, today. We'll see you soon. Yes, welcome back. Interesting insights have been given to us on this show today on agriculture. One of them is the fact that there actually is a lot of money to be made there. But one thing they haven't told you, though, is that, like this Yoruba song says, It is hard work. Whether you're farming seeds or chicken or cassava, or you have funding agriculture, it is hard work. So on the panel now, I have all of them sitting right here to me. Before all of us are thinking, yeah, I think I'm going to get my son to be an agriculturist. What do they call them? What do they well, call them? Now we call them Nagropreneurs, Nigerian agriculture entrepreneurs. Oh, Nagropreneurs. <laughs> so both of you are Nagropreneurs. <laughs> yes. You are a research person, Dr. Kechuku is research. Yes. This is a nagropreneur. Mm -hmm. This is, well, in some ways you are too. Yes. Your yes. company funded, funded yeah. Yeah. a nagropreneur <laughs> yeah. yeah. initiative yeah. and you are a nagropreneur as well. Okay, I think the best place to start would be, is farming hard work and who is the original farmer? Let's take from the youngest farmer in the house. <laughs> so I'll call a farmer someone who engages in um, production right from the soil. It could be it could be seeds, it could be nursery, it could be core production of food, commodities, livestock. Um, it could be any aspect of their cultural um, um, value chain. It's related to food. It's, it, but it's, no, it's related to production. Oh. Farming is production because if you take food, um, there are raw materials for industry that come out of agricultural processes that are not food related. Rubber isn't edible, but it's an agriculture. Um, it's, oh. it's, you farm rubber, you have a rubber plantation, mm -hmm. but you don't eat rubber. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's basically primary production. Um, so a farmer is someone who engages in production of various raw materials. It could be food items, it could be commercial um, commodities, it could be raw materials. Timber isn't edible. It's also agricultural okay. practice. I think, I think, Dr. Duto, could it be that, because for us, when we think farming, we think food, could that be one of the reasons that it hasn't really picked up, I mean, it didn't really pick up early? What's your own percep perception of a farmer? Um, a farmer is um, basically anybody involved in the cultivation. You start from a seed and you grow that into a finished product that could either be used for industry, could be used for consumption, could be used for all sorts of um, various industries mm -hmm. come out of agriculture. And it's been difficult to get Nigerians involved in it because it is hard work. <laughs> it takes patience, it takes a lot of time for you to start from the seed to the um, finished product. So for a finance guy, who's a farmer? Well, um, I think for us at Sahel, we see um, 
Well, we extend farming to agriculture as agricultural business. You know, so we see um, agriculture as all the interlinked activities that take um, the pr products from the farm right to the fork. You know, okay. to all the, oh, the fork is. Yes. <laughs> if that's the case. Yes. <laughs> yes. You know, so um, the, the, the entire value chain from the input, like you mentioned, to the production, to the processing, and all the other support services that is required to actually get that food on the table. Mm -hmm. You know, so we, um, we, we like I also said, the farmer is actually the one that, that is actually involved in the production. But we think that the value chain, the entire agricultural value chain actually has a lot of value in it. Okay, that's why we're no longer talking about the farmer, but the Nagro Preneur. Yes, yes. So because it's an enterprise, yes. it's okay. an enterprise tied to production. Yes. Okay. Okay, but I wonder though, in what areas, where does research fit into that? For example, you know, well, even the basic farmer from when farming started, when Adam was doing it, mm -hmm. is that person who consciously takes in those factors that will make that crop produce. For whatever okay. reason. For whatever for food reason or for want, Yes, yeah. he has to get it in. And so science comes in that science now looks deeper to really find out what matters. Mm -hmm. What is the best time you want to plant? What is the nutrient you need to give at that stage? What is the biology of the plant saying? What does it need? Okay, science provides you those kind of uh, information. What is happening in the environment where that crop is growing? Mm -hmm. The farmer might not know, mm -hmm. but science will advise and say, oh, today rain might fall, tomorrow it will not fall, okay? Mm -hmm. So you need to spray today because uh, the rain will not fall. So we should and do it more, more scientifically to make it effective. For you to do the business, you can't run away from science because it's the science that gives you that edge mm -hmm. and makes you a business, a professional um, uh, a professional in the whole, in whatever, in the whole, it is in the whatever you do. thing you are doing. Okay, you want to yeah. cut in at this point? I, I think, um, I, think I, I quite agree. You know, like, um, I've, you, you notice that most farmers in Nigeria, when, when it's for production, they just go to take from the previous um, producers. Yes, yes, the last you know, year. And then, it works for us, though, but in the past. It works, <laughs> but when you compare what the yields that we make in Nigeria and our contemporaries out there, you realize that we actually was actually working. So mm -hmm. here beans, for instance, an average Nigerian use that just steals what he just produces, it will make maybe like um, one ton, ton per, per hectare. hectare. Mm -hmm. You know, but an average so someone in Indonesia can actually make like um, four tons on that same hectare. So you can imagine oh. how Nigeria, how, how my own soya beans in Nigeria will compare in terms of the cost to the guy that can actually make um, four tons on that same hectare. Why was farming exactly. in that level in the past? I mean, um, I guess it was also the level of knowledge at the time. Um, with research today, yields have become better improved. Um, even in Nigeria, we have farmers who, who use local techniques, local methods traditional methods to sow their seeds. Today with planters, you can actually have the spacing between your seed rows are better managed. And as a result, your fertilizer application where it's required is easier. And then that impacts in the end on your yield. Mm -hmm. And so uh, in times past, we used to have one ton of maize per hectare. Today, we have farmers who are doing between four and seven tons. So if a traditional farmer is harvesting one ton, and then a commercial nagropreneur is harvesting <laughs> seven tons per hectare, mm -hmm. same land size, same, um, well, initial input, mm -hmm. but then yields are different. The, his productivity is higher. His profitability is also better than the traditional but farmer. But you heard what Dr. Dutton said. I mean, I must, like, just give me a second, because he said it is hard work. Yes. You know what I mean? It yes. is hard work. Extremely it, hard. Um, I don't want us to over glamorize what farming is. But it is, is glamorous, too. I mean, it look is. at it. Is. <laughs> this is what a farmer should look like. I, I want to put it in perspective. Take um, the issue of research. 20 years ago, um, a chicken, for instance, would achieve two kilo at, in about eight weeks. Mm -hmm. Science and research now has made it such that we're able to harvest um, chicken at two weeks. I'm scared uh, of that, sorry, though. at two kg mm -hmm. in um, five weeks, you know, now. Uh, 48 days. Research and technology is absolutely critical as we move forward because Margins are dropping, efficiency so has become a key. factor. Uh -huh. Volume is important, and for us to be able to significantly increase output in Nigeria and yield. So what's the hard work inside? 
The hard work is that you, you, you need to have passion, you need to have focus, you need to have patience. Mm -hmm. I mean, take for example, where do you get your, the spice the spice in your... Okay, um, we actually work with outgrowers. So that means you have developed farmers who are... Yes, mm -hmm. at Ace Foods, we have actually over 800 farmers that we actually work with wow. to actually get the, get the spices. Mm -hmm. and, it, and for even at Sahel, most of the investments that we look at, we look at investments that actually, apart from growing the, from the company itself, it's the actually number work of, with a, a lot of... The number of people yeah. that will be involved yeah. in it. Yeah, and I think generally... Um, Agriculture is just like every other business. It's hard work for you to make it. It, it doesn't just happen. You, know, you just have to still seal the land. In, actually use your brain to I actually think, do Dr. Kijuku, you were trying to yes, button at that point. going to say that. You are a scientist uh, um, now. What do you know about farming? <laughs> or are you the son of a farmer? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, when we were in primary school, secondary school, and you, you are naughty, they send you to the labor prefect. What does he do? He gives you cutlass to go and cut grass. Mm -hmm. See, that kind of mindset made agriculture look like it's something you're going to suffer. You're, it's going, you're going to suffer. Well, I think it, it, it's changed. There are op options for people to go into the farm and you don't f follow the same drudgery that has been there before. So um, the improved seedlings that are available are able to mine nutrients much more efficient than local ones that are available. The uh, land development that is going around, you know, people now are mechanizing, makes it easier for you to uh, do much more with less pain, okay? Le much more with less pain. And when you have that increase in productivity and extra production, the pain is gone. Well, I, I know that, for example, in, in some of the richest countries, like, I mean, like America, the farmers are the, some of the richest people yes. in that country. Yes. And we see them on tractors and yes. going around. Yes. And you have your, a few tractors, yes, too. Yes, yes. Um, I mean, and it's interesting to say that it, it used Sorry, to be... Sorry, you know why I said that? Because what? he said drudgery. Yes. So but drudgery is no more... We're, we're moving away we're from moving away. that yes. because um, 10 years ago when I started off, we had no equipment at all. Today we have... Why, is, why was that so? Is that we were not cost. importing no, no, them? No, no, no. Was... There, there, there were equipment available, but you probably had one tractor to about um, 50, 000, 50 hectares or 100 hectares. Mm -hmm. But today, there are mechanization schemes around um, that my company has also benefited from. This is this a government some, initiative? Some or? government initiative where agricultural equipment are subsidized. And um, there's a newer one where there's the Greek enterprise hiring and um, um, centers where a group of people come together, cooperatives, and they jointly, they co-own equipment oh. to serve a certain mm -hmm. community. Mm -hmm. So in a community where you have 100 hectares um, to 300 hectare operation, um, there's an SPO, that's a service provider, who owns five tractors, who has um, um, the, the Implement. planters, implements as um, um, the seed planters, one combined harvesters, and, and that just makes life easy. It's like pooling resources. Pooling resources together. So they sitting, yes. you you all, sitting equipment. We all can buy a tractor. Some tractors, 75 horsepower, cost about 4.5 million naira. Yeah. So um, depending on the capacity of the equipment you want to buy. So funding becomes a major limitation. Um, and as a result, people can't, don't want to go in that direction. But today, we see more people just say, OK, look, I don't want to farm. I'll just own a center and be a service provider to farmers. And that's mm -hmm. making, taking the drudgery out mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. So all he needs are tractor operators who will come to my farm when I don't own a tractor, help me prepare my land, help me plant my seeds, and then I work with minimal labor to actually just do fertilizer application, um, weed management, what do you do? Um, cassava, and now we're looking into cocoa. Oh, wow. Even mm -hmm. the small scale farmer who are not up to a level to mechanize, because if you can't stomp your land, you can't mechanize. There are technologies. What is stomp your land? The stomp your land is to remove those uh, roots. Uh, when you've cut the tree, you know, mm -hmm. the roots are still there with a little mm -hmm. uh, part of the tree coming out. It's called a stump. <laughs> so when you stomp, you are removing them from the soil. Mm -hmm. So uh, it costs money to do that. It's part of land development. It's only when you do that that tractors can, can enter. Can so get the, in. Yeah, can get in. But there are other small implements like power tillers that can be used to get into there. But a small scale farmer who still can't get to that level, there are also smaller technologies he can use that makes this drudgery 
Yeah. Out of not to be so, so difficult. Yes. But I guess yes. the point is these days, if people see that we really don't have any option, yeah. uh, Dr. Duvhan mentioned the fact that demand is higher. That means people are going to be selling more. Yeah. But the point is, is it competitive? How do we get, even though demand is high, I don't think um, chicken that you guys produce is still any cheaper than chicken that's imported. No, it's they not. They sneak it in. Still. It's not. Yes, a huge. <laughs> they still sneak quantity. it in. <laughs> we estimate that um, the one the quantity that sneaks it's, into yeah, this country yeah. is valued at about five billion U.S. dollars. And um, what's if, the what's the volume that you guys are selling? We produce annually three hundred and fifty thousand tons of chicken. What's the and demand? About Ten billion eggs. Wow. What's the yes. demand? Oh, the demand is what is sneaking in plus what we are selling. So, so it's still huge. Room. We have a per capita consumption of chicken of about two kilo, two and a half kilo. That means per person per year, it's one chicken. Oh, that's and, low, isn't um, it? And developing countries on average, maybe about nine kilo. Advanced mm -hmm. countries, 25, 26 kilo. So the scope for expansion is unbelievable. So it's never too much to say, okay, he's a chicken farmer, I can do that. There's no, room. no, no, you can. And if Nigerians, popul the population continues to grow, the way it's anticipated to grow mm -hmm. to maybe 400 million in 2050, then it shows you the opportunities that are available in agriculture. It's, we have to give it serious attention. And um, I'm, I'm qu quite honestly, a good foundation has been laid by the current uh, Minister of Agriculture upon which we can develop you know, the, uh, the, the, the industry. So well, Nigerians should be ready that they should, that is one area that we shouldn't let go. No, definitely, because we can't let go. And I, I think the government, like I mentioned, I think they're doing a lot in terms of putting policies in place to ensure that if the Nigerian market, even the, even the producers in Nigeria actually can compete with even the contemporaries. Like what, there. for example? Well in, well, in the area of importation, like as it is, Nigeria, I think we import almost 4.2 trillion worth of food into this country. You know, you can imagine if that was actually being project, provided That's by Nigeria. Yes, you even twenty percent of the free on Nigeria. You know, but um, if that can be provided by Nigerians, that's just a lot of revenues. For so, us. What, so what do we do? Fifty yeah. percent. Yeah, no. And this is how I look at it. I, I, to break it down, I, I tell people who care to listen. I say, the food. Yes, our food import bill has reduced. However. There's a deficit. Yeah. And look at it from this perspective. The average Nigerian spends a hundred naira per meal. Mm -hmm. 300 naira a day, 170 million people. It means that it's an industry that has the potential of over 350 me billion daily. Wow. Do the math. Daily. Do Just the do math. math. Do the math. And, and, and that's looking, I mean, and that's daily, that's what, what would Nigerians spend averagely in a day on food. So, it's a huge industry where enormous opportunities are is, is, is Why available. Why are going into it? I thought it's just drudgery. Well, Why are going? Maybe it's difficult to get money. This why yeah, it this is why difficult I, to get I, money. I think yeah, it's of the vision that we want to pull out 11 million people out of poverty. Food security is just not food on the table. It's money in the pocket. Mm -hmm. they need, we have to get people start thinking about turning this food into making money. When you can make money, you can buy food. You can eat any kind of food you want so to eat. So people are looking at the, 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 the entre no, no, not entrepreneurial, the business side of it. It is connected. Economic you can't side. do without it connecting them. They must be connected. The market drives everything. So what is ITA doing to make that public? So, uh, well, uh, ITA is doing a lot in terms of um, uh, crop improvement, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, plant protection and processing, mm -hmm. in terms of technology transfer with a lot of partners, in terms of also data management and dissemination. So a lot of this is what is needed by new investors to plan, do their business plan, how to do the, grow this crop or grow this livestock or so. They need all those kind of information to mm -hmm. start with. Mm -hmm. And um, our, 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 our in terms of pest management, that is a, an area that is a serious, uh, uh, we have to look at because there's what about always storage? Threat. Storage, because yeah. that's another issue too. Yeah. Storage is another major area. That's, but instead of it being a challenge, it's an area people can invest in. Definitely, it's an investment like of as as <laughs> people talk about the vegetable in the industry. Yes. You know, like, as estimated about almost forty percent of what is produced, vegetable produced in Nigeria, actually lost between the farm and when it gets to the final. Um, the users, you know. So the question is that 
how, who can actually beat that gap so that that 40% is no longer lost? So I can decide to start a transport company, for example. Yeah. Who can produce, actually also yeah. decide to go into processing exactly. because we do not necessarily have to bring all the vegetables to the city fresh, yeah. which is where Farm Shop comes in. So you do, um, oh, and our shop. business and some of the other pe pe young people we're working with, to begin to look at value addition. Yeah. So mm -hmm. beyond harvesting, once the yeah. vegetables are harvested, what do we do? Can we freeze them? Can we dry them? Can we... On location. Exactly. On, on location, you know. So work with smallholder farmers to add value to their produce and then bring it to the consumers in a condition that is... Uh, still serves the nutrient and is beneficial and you still for need consumption. The, you need the researchers research. to tell the best Absolutely. way to preserve and all yes. of that. So, so that's one aspect. Then there's the logistics aspect. How do you then get fi this nicely packaged finished products to the market? So for those who want to come into your agricultural sector, investment in, in the logistics service industry is also an, a huge um, so opportunity. It's, it's one big hole. Yeah. One huge, I mean, value. The farmers coming from the north, coming to the white with, with their tomatoes and green. Yeah. Half of it is spoiled by the time it gets here. It's very important yeah. that whoever comes into the agri business must look at how it's connected in look the chain. Yeah. Yeah. Look at the whole chain. Look at the whole chain. Who are you selling to and who, who is going to be supplying mm -hmm. you? You just have to look at that whole chain. Otherwise, so, you'll be access, surprised. Access to money is not an issue. I mean, before, I mean, I wanted to round up. Yeah. Yeah. You are making it look so rosy. As if, as if you get up today and say, I want to be a it's farmer, the big deal. then it's going to happen. <laughs> Access to money is a huge oh, challenge. A because I'll tell you, I, I'm, I've studied, I've looked at a few countries, and Nigeria is probably the country where farmers pay the highest amount of interest. In most countries around the world, bank interest ranges mm -hmm. from 4 to 6% for farmers. Most of my farmers are probably borrowing money in the mid-20s. So you're killing so them. So it's, yeah, so finance is a big issue. So um, Sahel, some, are you some, yeah. some, some effort has started in terms of um, um, government interventions, but it's very, very little yeah. compared to the actual requirement. Is that why you're yeah. filling the gap? Yeah. In terms of finance, because I I'm think, almost yeah, now. yeah there, I think there are two major areas. One, Dr. Odiswa has mentioned, which is actually the government providing cheaper loans to, to the to farmer, farmers. which is the CAX loan. Mm -hmm. but, um, what Sahel does is that we manage a $100 million um, Fund, we do actually invest in private equity investment, so we don't charge interest, so to speak. Okay, but because you know, Nigerians don't like to own anything with anybody. <laughs> yeah, but, but it's actually like what we, what we, it's actually like a five to six year investment period. You know, so okay. we, what we, our own plan is that we go in, invest in that in that product, I actually work with you to actually see your company like actually gain value. Like a good option. You know, then mm -hmm. after after like five six years, we pull out and we work with you on. Exit, exit, an exit strategy right from the day one. You but know, it's only so. 100 million. I mean, look at the gap. <laughs> that's that's yeah, just, like a drop it's, in the ocean. It's 100 million dollars is not a lot, yeah. you know, but it's actually, I think, a step in the right direction. Maybe other in funders, please. Yeah. Yes, it's just like Dr. Dr. rightly mentioned, another thing to look at is political will. Um, beyond the federal government, trying to subsidize agriculture, give cheaper loans through the CBN. It's also important for state governments because land is owned by the state. Okay, and there's a land. huge need. Um, we have tons of smallholder farmers who can't grow to scale. And there's a huge need to prepare the land. Um, doctor here mentioned the fact that you need to stump. Mm -hmm. If you want to clear and stump one hectare with trees on it, it's an average of 250 to 400,000 naira uh, per hectare. <laughs> That's just land clearing. It does not involve bringing tractors to actually prepare for planting. So it's, Nigeria still is, is one of the countries so where agriculture setup is still the most expensive in the yeah. world. That's so we need to, to sub, we need to subsidize that sector heavily. Take the subsidy from the oil sector and just Put it in pump it into yeah. agriculture. No, but they say all oh, the farmers will marry marrying wives. No, I think Nigeria... Maybe you will marry four husbands. I don't need that. In Nigeria, we make it sound as if subsidy is a bad word. Yes. But after the Second World War, most of the European countries and the Americas heavily subsidized farming. And until we're able to do that on a massive scale, realizing that without food, the country is going to be unstable, we would not move 
forward the way we should. I must round up. You know, my, my director saying, come around up. But I'm just wondering, if this is the face of a farmer today, I want to be a farmer. Yeah. I mean, we oh, thought, yeah. we thought yeah. farmers were like in their 60s old and, you know, it's changing. 10 years ago. Ten years ago was like, yeah. Yeah. but it's changing, it's changing now. 10 years ago. And well, I must round up. I thank you for being with us. I thank, thank all you. of you for being here yeah. and for educating me. So now probably I just find one of my children that's going to be a farmer. Is it too late for me? No. Absolutely not. I, can, I think I'm going to invest in the logistics side. You can't stop. You, <laughs> you know, we'll find a way. Yeah. So thank you very much. Agriculture is a new oil. If you haven't gone to go and start digging into that well, too bad for you. But these people who I've had in this panel today have been able to help us see that actually agriculture is good business. I think you can be the next ag agropreneur. That's been Seriously Speaking for today. We'll see you again next week. Thank you for watching.